Greetings, this is Timothy Young, the Digital Apothecary, and I'm going to continue off talking about um, different um, uh, things in this book, and the one that I'm going to talk about is actually antibiotics, and I'm going to focus on syphilis because it's a really interesting disease to talk about in the context back then. Um, so again, this book was published back in 1945, and it's interesting because I like this one section here, penicillin. So this is, as you can see, in the chapter, um, Drugs Used in Chemotherapy. And they talk about naturally occurring chemotherapeutic substances. So, during the past several years, considerable attention has been given to the bacterial static properties of a group of substances which have been termed metabolites and antibiotics, which are derived as extracts from bacteria and fungi. So, keep in mind, this is in an era where, you know, this is all like brand new stuff. We're just getting towards the end of World War II here. This book was probably written during the war, and there were great medical advances during that time. But, you know, we have a section on penicillin here, um, which, if you're not familiar with the background of it, it's the, the story goes basically you have this guy that works with bacteria, and he goes away for the weekend, and the lab above him does work on fungi, and fungi drips down below through the boards, into this guy's petri dishes, he evaluated bacteria, and he comes back and he finds his bacteria killed off. And he's like, what the hell happened? Well, what happened was he realizes the fungi from upstairs are actually landing on top of the bacteria and killing them. So that kind of led to this whole idea, well, can we use that then medically? Because that'd be great if we could kill stuff. Um, so basically, this stuff has bacteriostatic action, they're saying. Um, against gram-negative organisms, but only in the dilutions low, but primarily it's good against gram-positive. Um, also uh, effective against anaerobic organisms. And comparatively non-toxic for animals when available in commercial quantities. And it may be of immense value, not only for local treatment of infected wounds, but on account of its low toxicity for intravenous treatment of severe bacterial infections. Um, cool! But it's not yet available for general medical practice, but limited quantities are being made available for ingestive, investigative purposes. Um, and they're talking about its use for Staph aureus, Streptococcus pyogenes, and such, uh, Syria gonorrhea. And I love this thing. Uh, because penicillin appears rapidly in the urine, it should prove valuable for infections in the urinary tract infection um, caused by susceptible organisms. You know, this is an era where we're not even getting into um, bacterial uh, resistance or antibiotic resistance. Uh, this is like a golden age here reading this. It's like, wow, this is a cool stuff. When this comes out, it's going to change everything for us. And we aren't even aware of it at that time. So it, it's it's amazing just seeing this here. Just It, it stands out like the, the, you can tell like the authors, everyone else in the community is like, yes, this is going to be amazing when it comes out because... All the other drugs talking back here really aren't, don't work that well. <laughs> um, but syphilis, that's what I want to talk about, because syphilis was a huge problem back then. Uh, and treatment in terms of how you actually got through it, um, you know, there's even talks about like yaws back then and such. They, they break it into like prophylactic treatment, abortive treatment, uh, secondary syphilis, primary syphilis, um, and just in, its impact on the body. And what they're using is arsenical drugs. So we see arsenic uh, derivatives uh, for treatment of syphilis. And I, I think that's quite interesting because, you know, we're, we don't do that. We have antibiotics that we use. Um, but again, this is kind of before the era of antibiotics really take off. So the one that really was kind of interesting is what it, it, it does lead into this whole idea as I read through it. Um, something called fever therapy, or hyperpyrexia. And this is covered in a different chapter, so I went back and read that. And basically what it was is, if you look here, basically the whole, the whole, the whole thought process here is, can you basically um, make someone have um, a fever? And by having a fever, basically burn out the infection. Um, and this is also because at this time period, now you have pyrotics that can reduce the fever. So I'm going to read over this, and you might find this very amazing that this was even considered back then. But generally satisfactory results have been obtained by infecting patients suffering from certain forms of neurosyphilis with a pure strain of the malaria parasite. This infection then produces a periodic marked chill and fever characteristic of a malarial infection. 
These periodic fevers, with their accompanying leukocytosis and increased antibody formation, produce marked improvement in a large percentage, but not all, of the patient's treatment. A sufficient number of chills and fevers are permitted to take place to produce a maximum therapeutic effects without exhausting a patient too much. The malarial infection is then cured by a course of treatment with quinine. The patient selected for this form of, of antisyphilitic therapy usually has severe cases of neurosyphilis, insanity, general paresis, uh, uh, tabes, which has failed to respond to treatment of arsenic, bismuth, and mercury preparations. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, the production of febrile reactions by the intravenous injection of the typhoid vaccine is also used in treatment of neurosyphilis. Coupled or double doses of the typhoid vaccine injected approximately two hours apart produce a febrile reaction of considerable magnitude in most cases. Um, Weinberg and Goldstein, a series of 801 injections of Terran, obtained a febrile temperature exceeding 103 degrees Fahrenheit, and more than 85% of injections with an average duration of temperature above 103 Fahrenheit of uh, 3 and one half to 4 hours. So, there's a figure associated with this, so you can see a spike that occurs. Um, some effects may be obtained by the production of artificial fever by, fever by injection of certain foreign proteins, um, such as sterile milk. <laughs> The use of the uh, Kettering hypertherm or by the application of diethomy, the best results appear to be attained by the combined use of some form of hyper hyperpyroxia intravenous injections of arsenical dry drug. So, what they're basically doing here is burning out, um, and they're basically only with the idea of using conditions that cause fevers that's predictable. So if you're not aware with malaria, malaria can cause predictable fever um, that can go up and down. Um, in this case though, what you can then do is then basically inoculate someone, I mean give someone um, malaria, cause another fever, hopefully treats basically uh, neurosyphilis, and then get them quinine to cure them of malaria. Uh, I, 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 it, you know, we're talking about an era where we didn't have a lot of treatments. Uh, this is what they were doing. <laughs> so, you know, just imagine having a conversation with anyone today and be like, okay, you have syphilis, we don't have anything to treat you, but we're going to basically make you have a fever because you failed some of our other agents uh, that we have currently available, which includes arsenic and mercury. And basically, we're going to make you have a fever of more than 103 degrees and it's going to burn out the neural syphilis. And then after we think that you're better, we're going to give you quinine to then get rid of that infection so you, the fevers go away. And if they get too bad, we have some antipyretics we can give you. And even going into the antipyretics section, you have like opium, quinine. Um, um, it's interesting, I actually talked about habit formation um, back then. And especially, when, you know, we talk about the opioid epidemic these days. So it's just really like methyl salicylate. Um, you know, we have acetosilic acid. Um, I haven't. I don't even know some of these other ones that they mentioned throughout. But the bottom line is just imagine how far we've come. I mean, I opened this up talking about penicillin, the whole idea of antibiotics being brand new and reading through what drugs they had available back then and what they were doing just to cure infections just amazing from that standpoint that I think if the authors of this and the people that have been practicing them had lived to see what advances came out and then let's take for instance people who were practicing at the turn of the century 1800s I th I'm sure they would just stand in awe of just what medical practice we have today because we don't really bulk at terms of like oh having treatment no what we actually have troubles nowadays is resistance we we had gone through the golden era where we had drugs that we kind of didn't turn an eye like oh okay, you have an infection here take this and you'll be you know better but now we face the whole premise of we're entering this another this post antibiotic age what are we going to do if our antibiotics don't work what do we do if we have more resistance this is what we used to do I hate to see us, you know, going back to an era where we're doing like crazy stuff like this because we have no other option. But I think that's why I hold a lot of, of hope for just, you know, in, in continued development. So if you take anything away from like listening and watching this, is the fact of the matter is that um, we've come a long way, but the danger has always been what happens when our treatment fails us and what comes next. Um, in any event, um, if you have any comments or suggestions, or if you want me to like, focus on any chapters here and talk about them, let me know in the comments below. 
Hey Matt, this is Timothy Youngster Digital Apothecary. Take care, have a good day.